Thank you for joining us. Welcome to Maryland Hall. I'm Margaret Davis, President and CEO. And we convene groups large and small in this uh, facility, but the experience is always very special. And the reason is truly you make it so. So welcome to your region's cultural hub. And what we're doing tonight in this very important City Doc speaker series that we're partnering on is really part of that cultural hub. It's a really it's a key spoke uh, because we're not an autonomous vehicle. <laughs> we depend on you to be here and interact on a topic. And it's our role to help present a topic that's going to stimulate your participation and your ideas that really help strengthen our whole community. The arts are the universal language, but without you, uh, we can't do in this community and in this entire region what we must be doing together, which is to grow uh, our community and solve our problems and create solutions together. We really engage everyone in this process, which is why our moniker is Art for All. And tonight, this is the art of ideas, the art of possibility, you know, the art of exploration, the art of city doc and making it work and moving forward, the art of the feasible, the, the art of civic engagement, and that's Maryland Hall. So thank you for joining us tonight. I'd like to introduce Robert Clark, our co-partner along with the city in the city doc series. And Robert runs, as you well know, our, our community's premier preservation and historic historical organization. It's a real, a real pleasure for Maryland Hall and Historic Annapolis and the city to help partner on this. Thank you. Good evening. Autonomous vehicles and emerging transportation technology has long been a favorite subject of mine. And I'm thrilled that we're going to be able to discuss it tonight. I think that the one takeaway I would ask you to think about as we go through this is that you become sensitive to the subject. In conversations that we've had with the City Doc Reimagined conversation, when we talk about autonomous vehicles and shared mobility, we think about something that's in the 28th century as opposed to Wednesday. Now, it's probably somewhere between those two, but it might be closer to Wednesday than the 28th century, and it obviously will be evolutionary instead of revolutionary, but it's, it's coming and I'm delighted to have our speaker here tonight. With regard to the city doc conversation, parking and transportation are the two major issues. And for a community and a world-class heritage tourism site, this is a big deal that we've been grappling with for years. Rapid advancements in development of autonomous vehicles and new technologies must be factored into long-term planning might not need a whole bunch of $20 million parking garages if there are no cars. We all know that transportation technology is moving at a rapid rate, and with the emerging technologies comes opportunities. As I've said before, preservation is not looking back, but looking forward and planning for the future. I'm looking forward to learning more about this subject, and thank you for being here. I join Margaret in thanking Maryland Hall, the city of Annapolis, Severn Bank, downtown Annapolis Partnership, as a response, now I'd like to introduce our Mayor, Gavin Buckley. Thank you all so much for being here. This is awesome. Um, I have a quote um, in my office um, on the shelf. It's a Thomas Jefferson quote, uh, and it reads, um, I prefer the dreams of the future to the history of the past. We know that the Founding Fathers were New Ideas guys. They were progressives. They started the greatest social experiment in the world. So wouldn't it be amazing if this town, this beautiful historic town, could be on the forefront of new ideas without losing its charm while maintaining its amazing historic scale? We're going to hear from a speaker tonight. And I'm not going to spoil his talk by diving into his specific area of expertise. But I do want to highlight how this talk pertains specifically to what the city of Annapolis is doing. First, we are working on our 2020 comprehensive plan that lays out the city 
how the city will prioritise planning over the next decade. Transportation infrastructure plays a key role in forecasting, in that forecasting exercise. I encourage you to participate in any of the comp comprehensive planning meetings. You'll be better educated after transportation after tonight, so your input will benefit the city as a whole. The City Council recently passed a budget for the next fiscal year, and as part of that, we decided to move forward on the rebuild of Hillman, which, when rebuilt, will mean taking the garage from 400 spaces to upwards of 700. That's a great deal of additional parking for downtown, but we want to build it with an eye to a time when people aren't using cars in the same way, and we have to be open to these possibilities. That rebuild will give us a chance to create a private-public partnership that will allow us to do things like digital signage in parking. Imagine coming into the city and knowing the pricing and number of spaces available at each garage. In terms of what's happening at City Dock with the Urban Land Institute study, Action Group, and their working teams, part of their work is to look at the evolution and development of ways to connect all wards in the city to the crown jewel of the historic district at City Dock. We don't just want City Dock to be a hub for tourists. We want it to be a place where locals come to participate in community and to connect with friends and family and neighbours. Some of this means making City Dock a focal point, a place that incorporates green space and placemaking. For the overall vision of connecting the city, one ward to another to another, we, are also, we will also be looking at extending pedestrian and bicycle pathways. We're working with BG&E to utilise the right-of-way adjacent to West Street that extends the Poplar Trail. We're calling this the WE, the West East Express. This pathway will connect residents to jobs at the medical centre and the mall and provide a connection from the city to Waterworks Park, a 600-acre parcel that, uh, that the city owns off Defence Highway, which right now has volunteers creating trails for cycling and walking and running that will be open to residents in the fall this year. We've recently created a task force to look at prop a proposed private-public partnership to move public works off Spa Road and use the funding of that to build pedestrian bridges over Forest Drive and Spa Road, making communities beyond Ward 1 accessible and interconnected. This idea was championed by the late Speaker Mike Bush to connect amenities like downtown to Maryland Hall, to the recreation fields, the Boys and Girls Club and the Senior Centre and to the library. These are just a few of the goals we can work towards as a city. While we're grounded in our rich history, we also have an obligation to move our city forward and to meet the transportation needs of residents in the future. It is hard to think about how that will look, but I'm hopeful that listening to Dr Chapman's lecture tonight will open your mind to the possibilities. Now I'd like to hand you back to my, uh, my bromance friend, Robert Clark. <laughs> bromance. Tonight we brought Dr. Tim Chapin here to speak about autonomous vehicles <clears throat> excuse me, and shared mobility. As I mentioned before, many of us think that fully autonomous cars are something that will happen in the next century. Dr. Chapin is here to tell us that autonomous cars will happen in our lifetime. I hope after you hear his lecture, you'll become sensitized to the issues of autonomous cars. That as we move forward in the planning of our city, we consider the impact it'll have. We're planning for parking and garages and such. We're planning for the future that includes this new technology. He's the Dean of the College of Social Sciences and Public Policy and Professor of Urban and Regional Planning at Florida State University. He's a noted expert on land use and comprehensive planning, 
growth management and urban redevelopment. His current research revolves around how Florida's demographic, dem excuse me, demographic trends influence urban patterns in transportation systems. His interest in transportation technology has been growing over the last five or six years. He grew up in Falls Church, traveled to Annapolis many times, on the way to his family home in Rehoboth. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Tim Chapin. Good evening, good evening. Uh, I, I'm developing a bromance with the mayor and uh, with Robert as well uh, over the course of the last day. I've had a remarkable visit today and it's a real pleasure uh, to be here tonight to talk with you about the future, uh, but a future that is now. Um, I'm going to be speaking tonight about autonomous vehicles and ride sharing, um, uh, Lyft, Uber, that type of thing, and how it is going to be impacting this amazing community of yours. Um, over the course of the next several decades. So that's the theme of the, uh, of the talk. But I want to start off by telling you just a bit about myself, uh, and this was hinted at in um, uh, the opening there. Uh, I am from uh, the region, Falls Church, Virginia. My parents are here. A uh, picture of myself uh, uh, back in the, uh, it must have been, what is that, mom and dad? The 70s, early 80s there, and that uh, wonderful uh, striped shirt uh, with two of my siblings, and then my two kids uh, about a year ago over in Rehoboth, which we love to go to. I've been to Annapolis many times. You have a remarkable community, and I can tell you, I've consulted around the country. I've done work throughout to the United States and a little bit internationally, and what I'm struck by, not just in this room tonight, is a committed community to making a, an Annapolis that is beneficial for all, that is beneficial not just for the economy, uh, but for the people that live here. Um, and there's a real deep abiding love of this place that shines through, uh, and that's not always the case in some of the places that I've worked. Uh, a bit more about me. Um, I am not a transportation planner. I need to make that clear. I, I offer that up at the front. Uh, I talk a lot about transportation topics, but I'm actually a land use planner and a bit of a generalist. Um, uh, my first love is is how we live the way we do, how our communities are, are organized the way they're organized, and how we can create uh, uh, places that are special, that are economically vibrant, that respect the environment, and provide opportunities for all. Uh, that sort of triple bottom line of economy, environment, and equity. Um, so my, uh, I'm not a transportation planner, but I'll be talking about a transportation uh, topic tonight. The other sort of um, uh, last two bullet points, the one there is I believe in the power of scholarship. I'm a professor, I'm a scholar, I uh, uh, teach students and undertake research. Uh, when I'm not an administrator, and I believe in the power of higher education to make the world better. Um, I, I believe in translational research, so I talk very plainly and bluntly about the real world, and I'll be doing that tonight. And the other sort of piece in this, and this is sort of one of the big themes, is uh, planning. One of the joys of the profession that I've chosen to be a part of for the better part of uh, 25 years, um, its core mission is to be forward-looking. And what I want to offer you is an opportunity to look forward at some of the trends that are shaping the planet and how they, will, how they will shape this remarkable community uh, that you folks call home. Um, what's interesting is uh, five, six years ago, if you had told me I'd be standing in this beautiful building, in this uh, uh, old school, um, uh, uh, speaking to an audience about autonomous vehicles, I would have laughed at you and said, why on earth would I be doing that? I'm not an autonomous vehicles person. Uh, I did some work for the Florida Department of Transportation a few years ago looking at um, uh, transportation trends in different age groups, and I was invited to a conference on autonomous vehicles, and somebody put up a, uh, a and the diagram's not going to uh, move for us, of course, but what this is, is is an example of what we call a free flow intersection. And what autonomous vehicles will bring to the world, which is really sort of scary to think about, in fact, my palms get sweaty thinking about the idea, is a world in which there are no stoplights, that the vehicles are all speaking to each other and traffic just flows and the cars all talk to each other in real time. Um, and this is wonderful for our mobility if you're in the car, but I was at a presentation where, so, where it was a traffic engineer said, look at this future, isn't this amazing? And I said, look at that future, isn't that horrible? Because our cities are not for cars, our cities are for people. Our places are not for the devices that get us around, our places are for us as human beings, right? I, I think that's what it's about. So I was awoken to this sort of challenge of autonomous vehicles and became very interested in the topic. And I'm going to be talking about um, uh, sort of the, the big transformation that I think we're about to embark upon. 
the sort of the key theme, if there's one thing I hope you take away from tonight, uh, is it's, 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 it's my view that a little over 100 years ago, this little thing called the automobile came along and it completely changed the world. This was a truly transformative technology. It changed the way we travel. It grew our economy at remarkable pace. It allowed us to uh, see more of the world. It allowed us to live in far-flung uh, far locations. The automobile came along and the world and humanity was never the same, okay? And in many good ways and some not so good ways. Um, what I'm here to tell you is that it's my belief and what I want to try to sort of uh, lay out as my central thesis is that this technology is going to be equally transformative to the way we travel, the way we uh, construct our cities, the way we reconstruct a place like City Dock, or at least think about reconstructing it, that the autonomous vehicle and some of the other social trends that are happening around the sharing economy are going to change the world in remarkable ways, and now is the time to begin dealing with those potential changes. Um, as I look back and have learned my history of, uh, of placemaking and city building in America, um, the automobile came along, and what happened is the automobile drove decisions about our cities and our suburbs and our rural areas, and we designed places not for people but for cars. Um, the automobile came along and sort of disconnected the human from the place, and I don't think that's been particularly good for us as a species. I'm of the opinion that if we do right, and if we engage in this new technology now and look at the next 40 years of change that are coming, we can make a better not just city dock and not just better Annapolis, but have a better uh, set of communities, uh, not just in the United States, but around the globe. So the big takeaway today, it's my opinion that AVs are the next great transformative technology. They will certainly bring transportation and health benefits to us. Uh, I'll uh, show you a little bit of data in a little bit, but the great news is that AVs will uh, be a really uh, wonderful thing for us as a human species. Um, many thousands of fewer people will die every year in automobile crashes. Why? Because AVs are better drivers than humans. Um, and I'll show you some data on that uh, in a little bit. Uh, AVs will also bring um, really um, potentially great benefits to our systems themselves, uh, the arteries of our communities, our roads, our bikeways, our, bi our um, uh, sidewalks uh, have the potential to flow better as this technology comes on board, and I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, but the thing that I'm really going to focus on in the back half check, check, there we go, on the back uh, half of the talk is uh, this idea that not only will we be safer and be able to travel better potentially, but our communities will need to begin to think about uh, the design of our, of our roadways, of our um, uh, parking garages and, and other things like that. I know that's a, a, something of a topic these days that we've already been hinted at. Um, I'm also going to weave into this, this the part of the story about ride sharing and the sharing economy more generally. I think AVs and, and ride sharing come together to form this really exciting uh, combination that allow us to return some of our urban places to be human-centered and, uh, and less auto-centered than they've been. So that's the, the big theme of the day. Okay, uh, I should mention this is based upon some work that I did with some colleagues uh, at Florida State University. Uh, these are free uh, reports that are out there in the world. Uh, if you have trouble getting, in, uh, getting access to them, I'm happy to share them. Uh, I believe, again, in the power of scholarship and, and good work to make the world better. So uh, um, uh, we'll get you some links to any of the stuff that you're interested in, but I need to make sure I hold up that I did this work with some great uh, colleagues there at Florida State University. Um, what I want to do at this point is to make sure we're all on the same page regarding autonomous vehicles. Uh, one of the things that's interesting is all of us know a little bit about it, but a lot of us don't quite get exactly how the technology works. Uh, autonomous vehicle technology is actually a lot more sort of complicated than we go from somebody that's a human behind the wheel to all of a sudden the car drives itself. And in fact, the federal government and some of the uh, uh, groups that they work with have uh, come up with this idea of sort of levels of, of uh, uh, automobility here. Um, and what they've got here is uh, five levels of autonomous driving. And one of the big messages is, is that we don't just go from a world in which we're all driving cars to all of a sudden the robots, whoever that is, are driving the cars. Um, we are currently at, uh, uh, many of us still uh, are, are driving vehicles that have zero automation, no ad advanced features, but I'm willing to bet several of you in the room here uh, have vehicles that are beginning to have features like cruise control, like lane assist. Um, uh, some cars on the market help you park uh, and will park for you or at least do most of the work. These are all steps 
towards fully autonomous vehicles. Uh, there are autonomous vehicles on, on the market. They're expensive. They're not widespread yet. They're still in some, phase, uh, some ways being tested. But we're on this um, path towards auto mobility. Um, and it's not, an, it's not an either or. In fact, I'll talk a little bit later on about this idea that we're going to go through a transition phase. It'll be several decades long in which we go from largely human driven to uh, essentially um, uh, all uh, autonomous uh, vehicles down the road. Uh, how does the technology work? Again, I don't want to get too far into the details here, but there's a lot, billions and billions of dollars of investment behind the technology here. Uh, there's all sorts of, of uh, um, uh, uh, computing power that's embedded in the vehicle. It's constantly monitoring its environment, uh, much like we as humans do when we drive, and in real time is making um, hundreds of thousands of decisions about speed and direction and, uh, and monitoring uh, any threats uh, and any potential accidents. Uh, and signage and all sorts of other things that it might need to look at. Um, uh, this is not a talk about the technology, um, and I'm not an engineer and don't play one on TV, but what I can tell you is that the technology is moving and it's moving very, very fast, um, and it's pretty powerful stuff. Uh, I've ridden in uh, one or two of these vehicles at some of the trade shows I've been to, um, and when you get in a car that has no uh, steering wheel and they say, let's go, it's a little intimidating. I won't lie to you. It's, it's, an, it's, an, uh, it's an exciting adventure, but the technology is there. Um, essentially, what the uh, vehicles are doing is in real time, they're taking a picture of the world, just as we do when we drive, with our eyes and our ears and our uh, general senses of awareness. Um, in real time, it's, it's as I say, uh, uh, tracking its, uh, its direction, uh, it's tracking its location on the planet, it's tracking what's around it. Um, as we move forward, um, vehicles might very well be talking to each other so that in real time they can work with the other. Um, and uh, it's this very exciting uh, thing that um, uh, it's replacing, again, the, this very complex task of driving um, in all weather, in all settings, uh, and, and the technology is well on its way. Um, it's not all the way there yet, but we're getting there. So there's this real-time uh, data gathering exercise that it undertakes um, as it navigates the world. Again, obviously not getting real technical, but you get the idea. Um, one thing that's worth mentioning is sometimes people talk about different things. Uh, autonomous vehicles are just about the car itself being driverless. You may hear about connected vehicles or uh, CVs. You may hear about electric vehicles or EVs. Um, these are sort of different slices. Um, the EVs is a whole different piece. Uh, connected vehicle technology is uh, also advancing, where the vehicles speak to each other, they speak to the infrastructure. Uh, the mayor mentioned uh, the vehicle might speak to the garage and send a signal ahead to that new garage that may be built and say, hey, is there a spot available? And you could imagine a future in which it may even reserve it at a cost for you so that you know that that spot is sort of uh, reserved. Um, so AVs and CVs, and again, I don't want to get it too far in the weeds, but uh, there's a lot going on on the technical side of things. Now, what's interesting about this, and this is based upon some work we did a few years ago at FSU, is we surveyed uh, Florida residents and we asked them, how likely are you to ride in an autonomous vehicle? And an even better question is, how likely are you to put somebody that you love in an autonomous vehicle? A parent, uh, uh, your, your, your spouse, your partner, your kids, right? How likely are you to do this? And essentially, there was about a 50-50%. You know, half the, half the people said, yeah, I'd do it, and I'd put my kids in there, and the other half said, I'd never do it. And as we interviewed some of the folks that said, I'll never ride an AV, we say, well, have you ever considered that you've ridden in an autonomous vehicle before? And I would actually argue that everyone in this room almost certainly has ridden in an autonomous vehicle before. And I'm going to show you a picture of one of the greatest autonomous vehicles that I'm quite certain you've all ridden in. That's an autonomous vehicle, folks. Right? You get in, you push a button, and it takes you from one location to the other. There's no driver. There's no steering wheel. There's no pedal. There's no brake. This thing moves you around. This is an autonomous vehicle. A um, uh, hundred years ago, uh, and even back uh, as, uh, as uh, uh, big buildings were being built and elevators who existed, back in the day there was somebody there to get you up and down, an elevator person um, uh, to take you around. Um, that uh, went away as people became more comfortable with the technology. Um, the story there, and if you look at sort of the social psychology literature, is people do adapt to the technology, um, uh, as have many of us to these little things called cell phones that we all carry around and use as uh, microcomputers. So there are some people that say, I'll never do it, but never is a long time, uh, and behaviors do change, and that's clear as we look at the evidence regarding some of the other technology out there. Okay. 
Um, it's important to also recognize that oftentimes when people think about autonomous vehicles, they immediately think, my car, my car. How would it uh, uh, work as an autonomous vehicle? Well, your car and a version of your car might very well be autonomous down the road, but there are all sorts of different models being developed. Um, some very futuristic looking one person pods like you see here in the lower left. Um, you can imagine this is a concept car uh, on the lower right there that shows um, uh, that people might not even be facing all in the same direction. You can imagine a family playing cards or, uh, uh, or chatting or eating a meal sitting in the middle of a minivan that has no steering wheel and they're just being carried along. Uh, universities are looking closely in the upper right at um, uh, on-site fixed route transit systems for their university uh, students to move around campus. Um, other examples out there, um, uh, there are um, rapid transit um, uh, and mass transit companies looking at automated buses, which is an interesting idea. Uh, believe it or not, there are some folks looking at an automated motorcycle or scooter, and you say, why on earth would you want that? Well, if you own the scooter, and you ride the scooter to work, but then you could send the scooter home or send it to park, and then you could call that scooter to come pick you up. So they're working not just on um, uh, cars and buses, but they're also working on scooters and motorbikes as well, because people might want to own one of those, but then send it to park uh, at a remote location. Um, the scale is... My, there we go. Um, it's, we're getting down to uh, delivery bots. Uh, this is a picture from, I believe, Berkeley, California, or maybe San Jose, I can't recall, in which there, um, this is an autonomous um, food delivery bot, uh, where you call your local restaurant, you order up that sandwich for lunch, uh, they put it in the bot, they type in the location, lock the uh, device or lock the delivery bot with a code and it delivers your meal and then you enter the code and open it up and you get that meal delivered to you. So it's from the scale down to uh, uh, meal delivery or package delivery. Amazon is looking at things like this, uh, surface autonomous vehicles. Um, but one of the uh, particularly fast adapters on the uh, autonomous vehicle front is actually the trucking industry. Uh, and one of the questions I got in a meeting earlier today is, who do you think are, is going to be one of the early adopters of AV technology? And it's the long haul trucking industry. Why? Because the logistical cost um, uh, savings wrapped up in autonomous vehicle technology, being able to haul goods over long distances, particularly in remote locations, um, is, a, is a, a great saving. Uh, savings. So, and not only will they be autonomous, but they will likely be in convoys like this because there's a lot of fuel savings around uh, uh, trucks uh, clustering together and saving on the drag and fuel costs. Um, so it's, it's not just cars, I guess, is the big message. It's all sorts of things. Um, where are we headed in this? Uh, there was a lot of talk in the meetings I had today, and of course, that's oftentimes the first question. How soon do we think this is going to be? Uh, this is one of the estimates out of a National Governors Association office. Um, as I've read and looked into this, this is thought to be a little bit conservative, but if you look in the, uh, the 2050s timeline, they're essentially saying about 50% of the fleet would be uh, AVs uh, uh, by about 1950 at the low end, and about 70-75% uh, uh, at the high high end. Um, there are different projections out there. This one, to my mind, is a little low, but it's probably a relatively safe one um, in terms of about half the fleet by 2050. I tend to think it's going to be a little higher than that. Um, the typical turnover in a vehicle fleet in the United States is about 40 years, 35 to 40 years, particularly as the cars have gotten better and they last longer. Um, so even if we started today with all AVs, it would take us several decades to sort of age out or get rid of all of the human-driven vehicles now. Um, so uh, those are some of the projections about this. We may get more on that in the Q&A. Um, in terms of um, one of the, the sort of the big things pushing this, and this is, goes to something Mr. Clark uh, hinted at, um, if this was just one or two automakers that were interested in this and one or two people sniffing at this uh, potential opportunity, that'd be one thing. All the automakers, all the tech companies are in AV these days to the tune of billions and billions of dollars. Why are they there? Because there's billions and billions of dollars of market to be made. There's billions of, of new markets to be explored. Um, this is the future of the automotive um, uh, industry. Um, and in fact, they're real sort of worried about that. So they need to make sure they get to market with a quality product. Uh, so uh, there's a lot of momentum and energy behind this that uh, uh, Robert spoke about in his opening remarks. Okay, uh, let me talk a little bit about why AVs are good for us sort of societally, uh, societally uh, at the transportation level. 
Um, first of all, it's important to understand that AVs bring some real uh, potential benefits in the area of safety. So just a few uh, statistics for you uh, on the downside. Uh, at least 30,000 Americans lose their lives every year in automotive crashes. Most of those crashes are because of human error, not the uh, technology, not the car falling apart, um, not bad weather, um, true human error. Um, sometimes accidents truly do happen, but most accidents there's some degree of human uh, culpability in this. Uh, they, we go to great uh, length to understand and try to design away from that, but people spill coffee on their lap and drive into traffic, or they fall asleep at the will, or they've had too much to drink, or made bad choices otherwise that lead them uh, to an accident. Um, this is a real issue and the costs are stunning uh, to the economy. Um, in terms of efficiency, uh, and you folks know this, I'm from Little Tallahassee, Florida. Uh, it's not that little, but it's certainly no metro DC area. Um, coming up and visiting my folks, I'm always reminded how lovely it is to live here, but I sure don't miss the traffic. Um, why? Because you sit in a lot of it, uh, and that's not good for the environment, that's not good for our economy, and probably worst of, all, uh, worst of all, it can be bad for our mental and sort of physical health. It's, it's, it's aggravating and very stressful to do that. Uh, the costs of congestion globally, excuse me, at the U.S. level are uh, very, very, very substantial. Um, what do AVs bring to the table? Well, AVs are expected to help eliminate lots of crashes, help mitigate some of that congestion, uh, to help um, with the throughput of our, invest, uh, our existing infrastructure. Uh, they can benefit um, uh, uh, on a variety of fronts in just the functioning of the transportation system. Uh, so for example, uh, there's some data, and this is even early data, and I think the data will get even better. What I show you in the blue curve there is the conventional crash rate by age. And I can tell you that this chart always uh, bothers me a little bit because I've got a 19-year-old daughter and a 15-year-old son. And if you look at the chart and you sort of get what it's showing and look down here at the younger age groups, they get in lots of crashes. They're new drivers. They may not be uh, real mature behind the wheel. They may not make great choices. Uh, the crash rate falls precipitously um, through much of our life, uh, but then towards our uh, more sunset years in life, um, uh, crash rates begin to creep back up. Um, as we look at um, numbers for Waymo, one of the big companies out there that has been pushing AV, they've been putting cars on the road um, um, and tracking their crash rates. The total crash rate is in red. The Waymo at fault crash rate is in green. Again, these are early figures, but all of the evidence points to the fact that autonomous vehicles are safer, better drivers than humans, and it's largely because they don't make bad decisions, they don't fall asleep at the wheel, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So there's real benefits um, on the safety front. In terms of uh, the efficiency of our systems, I've got a picture of our uh, PAS report that we did for the American Planning Association in the top right corner. We sort of enumerate some of the benefits that AVs bring to our transportation systems. Um, AVs uh, uh, need uh, um, less lanes. Uh, AVs can um, um, uh, operate uh, much more closely together than human drivers uh, should and do, uh, or hopefully uh, do. Um, they can travel in harmony. We can change our infrastructure to um, allow for greater throughput, uh, for intersections, and so on and so forth. So the expectation is, if we do it right, and there's always that big if, AVs can actually benefit um, our transportation um, um, uh, mobility um, and move uh, the system along much more effectively than currently exists with human drivers. And that's without getting into some of the uh, um, uh, other stuff I'm going to get into on the built environment side. So. That's the front matter. I've sort of set you up just to make sure we're all on the same page regarding autonomous vehicles. What I really want to talk about, or what I'm here to talk about, is this topic. And I think it's largely been, I won't say um, uh, completely overlooked, but largely been overlooked, and that is how will this technology impact the built environment? So what we did uh, down at FSU, um, some colleagues and I uh, designed a study in which we got together with a bunch of people and we laid out um, some scenarios and we said, we're gonna put you on the ground in different locations in the state representing different development forms and we wanna walk through the driverless trip 
and then think about the implications of the driverless trip on these built forms. And we looked at a downtown in Orlando. We looked at this god-awful urban arterial in Pasco County. Anyone here from Pasco County? Beautiful county, but not that uh, arterial, just an awful strip. Um, a, a TND, a traditional neighborhood development in Dadeland, um, and a medical complex uh, in Tampa with USF. And what we did is try to understand what are the implications for these built forms, for these built places. And what we sort of drilled down to after a bunch of work is that there are sort of five big areas of impact. Um, and I've noticed my slides don't all translate perfectly, but uh, that's not me with a stray S. This S was up there with the pedestrians when, to, uh, when I looked at it. Uh, so we're going to talk about road design, signage, bikes and peds, drop-offs, and parking. And there's that magic parking, which is part of the reason Mr. Uh, uh, Clark, I think, invited me up, is to speak a little bit about that. Um, so let's talk road design. Our conventional streetscape, and I realize Annapolis is very different. You've got this wonderful colonial era town with very small rights of way built for a very different technology, pre-automobile. So I realize this isn't your streets, but in much of what we've got in the United States, we have a typical urban or suburban streetscape that looks like this. And if you look at the, va the stunning amount of asphalt involved in serving these, um, uh, these machines as they convey us around, it's pretty stunning. Uh, we've got our drive lanes, we've got uh, a parking lane, and usually we've got uh, pedestrians sort of marginalized at the edges. Um, five feet of sidewalk would be great, sometimes it's even less than that. So this is our conventional streetscape. What do we see? And here's one of yours, right? So you've got a lot of real estate dedicated not uh, so much to the moving of vehicles, but to the parking of vehicles, um, either on site uh, and parallel or nose in parking. Um, we use a lot of our ground to get these vehicles around, okay? So that's the big theme of this point. What we see when we look at autonomous vehicles is a real opportunity to reclaim some of that urban real estate and suburban real estate that's in our roads. Um, AVs have this wonderful ability to drive much more precisely than we humans do. When we humans drive, we tend to sway a little bit, right? That vehicle, and we're all on the highway, and that person sways over, and everyone sort of freaks out, and they're not changing a lane, but they tend not to drive in a nice straight line. Uh, AVs are ability, have an ability to do that, which means we might reclaim some real estate in our lane widths. Um, so they uh, have more precise driving. Uh, I mentioned before about this safety um, uh, component uh, that uh, AVs are likely to be, um, uh, cause a, a lot less accidents. Part of the reason our vehicles are the size they are is because of the safety features involved um, regarding um, um, sort of uh, uh, crash, um, uh, the collapsible parts of the car so that when you get in a crash you can be safe. There's an expectation over time that the vehicles can be smaller in size, um, which allows um, uh, for uh, some savings there as well. Um, and overall, there's this idea that uh, AVs will bring with them an opportunity to take that conventional streetscape and start rethinking it a bit. There's a big movement in planning, and I suspect you've had this conversation here with the mayor and some of the planning staff, is this idea of complete streets, this idea of streets not just for cars but for everybody. And the, uh, the idea here is that as we move towards AVs, we can shrink down our drive lanes from 11 and 12 feet down to 8 feet. That creates more room to do other things, like create bikeways, to expand our sidewalk size, uh, and so on. So AVs are going to uh, yield some found room along our typical uh, roadway rights of way. Um, let me speak now a little bit about bikes and pets. So uh, that was sort of the right of way piece. Now let's talk about bikes and peds. Again, you've got a really dense, exciting, complex urban environment. Um, lots of cars, lots of people, and some folks that want to ride bikes. Um, uh, the motorized scooters are coming. There's all sorts of exciting stuff going on in your urban setting. Um, I mentioned before that uh, AVs um, have a real opportunity to provide uh, benefits to our bike and pedestrians. Uh, more real estate for uh, things other than cars means more real estate for humans on two wheels, on two legs, um, uh, and whatever it might be. So uh, there's uh, folks um, in the bike ped world that see great opportunity in autonomous vehicles, although I'll speak in a little bit about one of the challenges there. So we can move even more uh, further along to that uh, complete uh, street agenda um, so here's our uh, auto-centric streetscape. Uh, we're now moving towards complete streets, and then as we reclaim some of that right away, we can get to um, a streetscape that is much more designed for humans and, and much uh, less designed for cars. We can have fewer lanes, 
um, we, we think, because of the, the size of the vehicles and the way they uh, travel uh, together. Um, uh, I'll get to drop off lanes in a little bit, but again, we can reclaim real estate, have wider sidewalks, have dedicated bike lanes, even in uh, Annapolis. As I've uh, got tour around uh, uh, the uh, community today, uh, there's a lot of on-street parking. Uh, there's a lot of um, used space in empty cars sitting there for many hours at a time that might uh, go away with the advent of autonomous vehicles. Signs and signage, uh, or uh, signs and signals. Um, I mentioned before free flow intersections. Um, uh, we've a um, uh, real possibility moving forward that the world of signage, and I do apologize for the slides not translating real well, um, this idea that signage and signals may completely change. If you think about it, most of our signage along our roadways is aimed at people driving along in a vehicle at 25, 35, 45 miles an hour. They need to be very large, they need to be very, very prominent. Um, if there's no longer anyone driving that vehicle and they're looking out the window or on their phone or on their pad or whatever it might be, the signage needs um, largely disappear because it's not about uh, receiving information about where the next stop is by looking out the window. A lot of information can be vended to the vehicle itself or vended to your phone, uh, which is actually how a lot of people navigate these days anyway. Um, I was at a, uh, at a conference and I met a, a member of the signage industry and they look at AVs and they're scared to death because if you're on an interstate flying along at 85 miles an hour in your driverless car, you're not going to be looking at billboards anymore, almost likely. Um, you're not going to be looking at the big roadway signs saying there's a McDonald's and there's a Burger King and there's a Wawa or whatever it might be. Uh, you're going to be busy, uh, hopefully, or uh, possibly doing other things. So that signage is um, uh, likely going to go away, which means potentially we've got even more attractive urban environments than we did before. I hope I've got that slide in there. I don't even know where this was. This is one of those stock images uh, off the internet of, of awful place uh, uh, USA um, that uh, we all know. Uh, I know I've got uh, streets like this uh, that I've worked on throughout Florida. Lots of signs, lots of wires, lots of clutter. Um, let me tell you, I look at that, and the one person I worry about most in that picture is not a single person in those cars, it's this person over here. Right? Uh, that's what I worry about. Uh, and that environment screams automobile-centered, not human-centered. So signage and changes to the signage industry. Um, this idea in the future that signals, traffic signals are going away. I'm not saying next month, I'm not saying 10 years from now, but down the road, we won't need traffic signals when we have AVs that are fully online, or at least much more close to fully online, which will be an interesting transition period. Um, oh, on the downside, though, we will lose great art like this, right? Uh, we are in an art place, right, a place that we celebrate art. How can we not respect the art of some of the billboard industry out there, right? Uh, so I had to share that just to, to remind us that, you know, it's not all bad, uh, those billboards. Um, my favorite, and I didn't, I should have got a picture of this, is as you drive south on I-75, um, between, I think it's Gainesville and Tampa, uh, there are, I think it's three or four ads from a doctor that does lots and lots. He's apparently the world's leader in vasectomies. And he has billboards about every four miles. Um, uh, I, I don't know why, but that's, apparently that's how he gins up a lot of business. So we will lose some great art along the ways, but uh, I think we'll be better for it. So um, the signage industry is going to have some challenges. Uh, parking, boy, there's that, uh, that magical topic that uh, is motivating a lot of you and a lot of the energy in this town. Um, first of all, uh, I'm not the parking expert. There's a gentleman by the name of Don Shoup at UCLA who's the godfather of parking that's written a lot about this. He's the real expert, but what I know is that, boy, we use a lot of real estate and a lot of land in this country for parking spaces. We actually don't know how many parking spaces are in there. I've seen as low as only 600 million spaces around the United, just the United States. I've seen as high as two billion spaces um, uh, in the United States. Uh, I'm gonna go for a billion, okay? Um, a lot of room in, uh, in parking. What's interesting about parking is that each of us only needs three spaces. One at home, one at work, and one wherever else it is that we're going. Right? Those are the only three spaces we need, and that's the way we provide parking, typically. Is, uh, it's oversupplied in almost every destination. Um, so parking is a, a major issue. Uh, if you look at our more urbanized areas, even Annapolis, 
uh, revolutionary era, uh, community built for a very different technology, people uh, on horses and wagons on two feet. Um, you, have, uh, um, uh, you have an urban form that just screams people-oriented, but if you actually look at the aerial photos of the city, and I didn't do an analysis of this, but it's stunning the amount of real estate that uh, even your very dense, very mixed-use, very um, people-centered uh, community has in parking spaces. It's a big challenge and a big potential waste of space if we don't use that land particularly effectively. So uh, this is actually uh, uh, one of the aerials that I pulled off the internet that shows uh, um, uh, this is a challenge, um, and we're actually down there today looking at this space. You've got this beautiful water view, you've got this amazing waterfront, and what do we have sitting down there? Lots and lots of empty cars. You're not alone in this, by the way. Most cities have done this with some of their most beautiful special places. What do we do? We turn them into surface parking. Boy, that sure doesn't make a lot of sense to me, and I suspect to some of you as well. So what do we think about the impact of AVs? Well, first of all, let's talk about just the simple fact that moving forward, if we have autonomous vehicles that can park themselves, we can think differently about the way we use our parking garages, parking spaces, our surface parking. We don't have to worry about keeping room for people to get in and out of the cars. Why? Because there won't be any people in the cars when they're parking themselves. As we look at our garages, um, we won't have to think about some of the amenities that are there or required to be there for humans. Why? Because humans won't really be in those spaces very much. So we can rethink uh, the, uh, the access to and the amenities for uh, those, uh, those garages when we build them. Um, we'll have smaller vehicles. We can pack them more tightly. If we design the facilities correctly, um, the cars can even reorganize themselves as they're being called back to their user or to their owner. Uh, so there's some interesting changes just related to the AV technology itself. Um, where I think we're headed, and again, I've, I've done a little bit of work on this, and as I've looked around the country, is this idea of sort of parking reserves or parking um, uh, uh, zones. It's almost an, the, the analogy we talked about it over lunch, I think, was this idea of airport parking, where you sort of, you know, sort of put the car over out of the way, and it just sits until it's needed. Um, communities are talking about doing this. Um, I was asked a question in an earlier meeting, is there any community that is pursuing a centralized parking location that they then um, uh, I'll see as being their AV um, uh, garage down the road? The answer is no. Nobody's thinking that far ahead. Um, but they're starting to really rethink, do we need on-street parking? Um, uh, how much parking do we need if the vehicle never stops? Uh, I'll get into the shared AV model here in a little bit. But parking changes are coming because of the technology and then because of some of the uh, social changes that I'll get to uh, in a little bit. Uh, let me keep moving. Uh, this is just an example. Uh, Mercedes-Benz has partnered with Bosch uh, to, uh, uh, to speak about or to look at uh, the design of parking garages. And uh, this is one of the schematics they've come up with. And again, it needs to be designed for easy, um, for those uh, self-driving vehicles to get in and out of there easy. Um, again, this is Mercedes and Bosch. These are two multinational billion dollar, many billion dollar, probably trillion dollar companies that are looking into this and designing new uh, garages down the road. Okay, I think that's the parking story. The other big challenge that urban areas are wrestling with is this drop-off revolution. And we've all been there and been that person that was there. You get in your Uber, you get in your Lyft, or in this case, you get in an autonomous vehicle, and you get driven to the restaurant, and you want to be dropped off at the restaurant at its front door. And there's a free flow traffic lane, and the car stops, and either you get out, or the person that you're behind, wondering why they've stopped, hops out of the car and goes into the restaurant. We need to accommodate this drop, this change in sort of behavior, of travel behavior. It used to be we'd go park in the garage, in the parking space on street, in the service parking lot, and walk to uh, the restaurant. Now AVs we see, a future in which the AV drops you off wherever you'd like to be dropped off. But do we really need to drop off people at every single location on the earth, at every single address, at every single business? Uh, and some communities are starting to think about drop-off zones, almost like taxi stands but without taxis, where Uber, Lyft, and the other ride-sharing services, or in the future, AVs drop them off, and they're uh, located you know, one per block, or one uh, every other block. Um, uh, so we're not dropping off at every single location, and they're working on that. But this idea of drop-offs as a big challenge for communities. 
Um, Drop-offs um, uh, are in many ways becoming the parking replacement. And in fact, for AVs, uh, that will likely be the parking replacement. Um, and I'll talk about shared AVs in a little bit, but this idea being that you get in a car, it takes you to your destination, you hop out, and the car continues on to its next, um, uh, its next user, or whoever um, uh, is gonna take a, uh, take a ride in that vehicle next. Um, where do we put these parking uh, drop-off zones? This is part of the challenge. I've got a few suggestions here towards the end of the talk. So again, let me keep moving here. Um, actually, this is an example uh, out of the report we did for um, uh, FDOT. Um, so this is uh, just a sort of a generic urban setting. We're just trying to visualize what some of this might look like. Here we've got an urban setting, setting with a, a two-way uh, roadway, one lane each way with parking, uh, on-street parking each way. Um, if that on-street parking isn't needed anymore because the AVs keep moving or because we don't want it to be used as on-street parking, uh, we talked about those are primary zones for drop-off locations, and then maybe the other side could be used for an expanded walkway, a uh, bike, uh, bikeway or scooterway, uh, and other um, uh, sort of motorized mobility uh, side of things. But again, this idea that people go, well, I don't know where we find the space for those things. Well, we actually have a lot of that space already in some of the on-street parking and some of the other locations we've got in our cities and the way we're using them. Um, okay. Uh, and again, the, the slide didn't quite shine through there. The ride-sharing revolution uh, we'll talk about now. So I talked about sort of the AV piece, and what I wanted to make sure we remind ourselves of is that there's this remarkable shift over the last handful of years in ride-sharing. And again, I'd be willing to bet many people in the room have uh, used a ride-sharing or ride-hailing surface, like Uber or Lyft, and I'm not here to pitch for them. There are lots of other options out there. Um, uh, but the ride-sharing revolution has come along, and I think ride-sharing and AVs combined offer some really interesting changes for our cities. Let's talk just a little bit about ride-sharing. Um, most, of it know, most of us know what it is. Um, again, you, uh, uh, you order up a vehicle, uh, usually by your phone. Um, you tell it where you want to be picked up. You tell it where you want to be dropped off. Um, there's no exchanging of cash. You don't have to get out a credit card. Uh, it's all app-based, uh, and you get from location to location, and it sure seems pretty cheap, um, particularly compared to a taxi if you're in big cities. Um, it's uh, the two biggest providers in the USA are Uber and Lyft. They're very big uh, globally, but in other markets around the world, there are other very substantial providers. Um, just to give you a sense, Uber um, is over uh, 10 uh, billion trips. Um, they reached, uh, they started really in about 2009. They reached their first billion trips in 2015. Um, they're now um, on track based on their uh, ridership data that they uh, publish publicly, and again, they're not real open, it's a private company, but as best people can tell, they average about 14 million trips per day um, uh, globally. Okay, so they're moving a lot of people around, around the globe, and that's just one service provider. Okay, Uber is the one that's biggest uh, in this country. Um, it's not biggest in several other big uh, markets around the globe. Uh, on the right-hand side there is some of that data that as I, as a social scientist, like, which is, well, are people of all ages taking up Uber and are the rates sort of on the rise across the board? And the short story is yes. Uh, the wonderful Pew Research Center uh, surveyed people back in 2015 and in 2018 and asked them about ride-hailing services. And again, if I'm in a business, these are the type of growth numbers that I would love to see. This is good news for the industry um, and a clear sign that this isn't a fad, that this is something that has really taken off um, and, and it, it works for a lot of people. So uh, ride sharing is a big, big deal. And I'm sure you see this here in Annapolis. Um, what I want to sort of link is this idea of the sharing economy with uh, um, autonomous vehicles. And again, my view is, and again, this is where I will play futurist, and I will tell you that what I see is a future in which individuals don't own cars, you own access to a car service. You may subscribe to the Mercedes car service, or the Nissan car service, or the Toyota, or the Ford, or the GM and you dial up a car, and you don't own a car, you own access to a fleet of cars, and you can tell it, do I need a big car because I've got a lot of riders? Do I need a smaller car? Do I need something because uh, I'm going to Home Depot, I need to get a bunch of um, uh, uh, stuff to do that yard work that I've been putting off for several years? Uh, do I need a truck to put stuff in? But you order up the type of car you need when you need it, and you pay to subscribe to a service like this. I think that's where we're headed, and in fact, it's not just me, the automotive companies and the tech 
tech companies think this as well. Um, what's exciting about this is that this is tremendously efficient because most of our cars sit unutilized most of the time. Um, uh, uh, around the country, you know, the, 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 the thing that cars do most and that some cars do best is to do nothing. They sit there and they claim they require insurance payments, they require you to maintain it for the few small percentage of time that you use it, um, uh, and, uh, and they can be very expensive um, uh, should you have any sort of unfortunate incident, mechanical or accident or otherwise. Um, so I think we're moving towards a model, and I don't mean tomorrow, and I don't mean 10 years from now, down the road, in which we will see the sharing revolution and the AV revolution come together. What does this mean? Um, oh, actually, I forgot if I put this slide in here. This is just uh, one example of all the automaker and tech partnerships. And this is a big, complex slide. Um, there'll be a quiz at the end, by the way. You're all being graded. I am a professor, so just be ready for that. Uh, so you have to memorize that. That's a joke, just to make sure. No, no heart attacks out there. Um, but uh, we've got uh, uh, tremendously deep connections between tech, automakers and others that might have a vested interest in being a part of this many, many, many billion dollar industry moving forward. Um, what they see is the importance of the technology working, the automakers wanting to be able to make the cars, but also get involved or get uh, in on sort of this ride sharing and this broader sharing economy uh, that we're seeing. Um, so as I say, this isn't just me, there are lots of other people far, far smarter than me that are talking about this as a, as a story. Um, what does this mean uh, for cities? Okay, this is where I was headed, is uh, there's some studies that say if we move to a model like this, we can shrink our automotive fleet, um, depends on who you read. Uh, some people say by 50%, some people say by as much as 85 to 90%. Um, that in the long run, we will need a lot fewer cars to move people just as effectively as we do now. Why? Because the vehicles are always moving, they're going on to the next rider, they're taking care of the next need, uh, and that is uh, seen as very, very efficient. Fewer cars on the road means less congestion. Fewer cars on the road means more potential right-of-way that we can consume for other uses like people on two feet, uh, people pushing that uh, uh, baby stroll, or people riding a bike or a scooter or whatever it might be. Um, I'll mention the thing that I see at FSU these days, it's not a bike, it's not a scooter, it's those hoverboard things um, uh, that, uh, uh, boy, the 19-year-olds uh, uh, seem to love at FSU. Um, and that's another uh, micro-mobility or motorized mobility uh, technology. Um, the exciting thing, as I say, is as we move towards this future, is there's a potential to make our cities and our places people-centered. Again, that's one of the big stories, and that's sort of the passion that I'm after. Um, let me sort of move into the home stretch. And one of the things I was asked to do is say, well, are there some places out there that are doing a really good job thinking about this? And the answer is, not really. There aren't many places that are doing a lot of work in thinking um, forward uh, about AVs and, and, and the sharing economy and electric vehicles, which I haven't even touched on tonight because I don't have the time. Um, but the city that I think is farthest ahead on this is the city of Seattle. They have this wonderful document, I've got the links up there, called their New Mobility Playbook, in which they sort of look ahead. And I can tell you, if you read the document, they don't have detailed recommendations. It's a big think piece from a big city saying, uh, the way people are gonna move around in this world is changing, and now's the time to begin planning for that. And at the core of this is they sort of identify four principles that are guiding their transportation planning. And um, uh, at its core uh, are the four principles. The first one is up there. Um, innovation, excuse me, information is the new infrastructure. Um, we need to have an information infrastructure so that we can tell people where to go and how to go. Uh, we see this more and more in cities where there are signs on the beltway telling you how long it takes you to get from one location to another. Uh, for those of you that use uh, the Waze app, W-A-Z-E, that tells you traffic conditions between uh, and the best uh, path between one place or another, that's information helping to make infrastructure better. Seattle is investing a lot of money in real-time data and information about buses, about uh, parking availability. Uh, the, the, the mayor mentioned that, or uh, Mr. Clark mentioned that. Uh, 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 this idea of information about roadway conditions at all times, um, and, and venting that out, that makes your infrastructure more efficient and makes people's travel experiences uh, uh, better. So information
information is the new infrastructure. Uh, people will share mobility. I've been talking about that for the last little bit here, but uh, the world is changing. Uh, these young people that, uh, that I get to work with every day at FSU um, really do operate differently than we do. They are in a, a truly digital age and they uh, will have different experiences and this offers this opportunity and their use to this idea of sharing. Uh, and I think about, again, my own two kids that wouldn't share anything when they were little and now they're just part of, you know, the Airbnb and uh, hop it in Lyfts and Ubers and uh, and they're, they're very comfortable with this idea of, of, of that type of, of uh, economic exchange. Um, the third principle, uh, and again, I haven't spoken about this one, clean energy will power uh, transportation moving forward. Um, the electric vehicle revolution is ongoing. There's a lot of uh, uh, battery issues that are still being worked through, but the battery power and battery life is much better than it's ever been and will likely only get better moving forward. Uh, so clean energy is an exciting thing um, and, uh, uh, and a real benefit to the human race and to this beautiful planet of ours. And the last principle is that automakers get it and they're operating in this way, and we need to enable and help them act um, as they move forward. What does this mean for what Seattle is doing? Again, if you read the document, they don't get into a lot of details, but they uh, lay out this wonderfully layered approach to thinking about their transportation system. And it's not just about roads and bikeways and sidewalks. It's about the information and how those are used, when they're used. Um, uh, it's about vending data in real time, and they've got this sort of layered approach um, to getting their transit system and having information about zip cars and other shared vehicles and, and Uber information about trips and destinations uh, and layering all that together to help them think about where they should be building garages and roads and bike lanes and things like that. Uh, to zoom in just a little bit on that, what I really liked about the graphic in here is if you look at the center one, is you've got car sharing, you've got pickup and drop off zones. Um, implied in here is that there's a subway underneath, there's a bike share, um, there's a bus traveling this route, and they're trying to um, uh, fold all of these different modes of travel together um, uh, in, in very powerful ways. Now, have they done it in amazing, um, uh, easily displayed uh, outcomes for you? No, they're still working through this, but this is the future of the new mobility as they see it. All right, so let me sort of bring this to a close and say um, I, I should at least offer you a little bit of a, of, of, of a path forward. So some ideas for transitioning to the no, new mobility. This is a, a variety of things went into this, some of the work we did at FSU, some of the work in Seattle, and some of the work uh, that we found from other places. Um, I can tell you, uh, this is just to show you that the transition from where we are now, which is almost all human-driven vehicles, to a future in which we've got autonomous vehicles is many decades in the making. This is literally a block away from where I live uh, in Tallahassee. I told you we've got beautiful streets in Tallahassee. This isn't one of them, but we've got beautiful streets in Tallahassee. Uh, this is uh, North Monroe Street, just north of downtown. We're actually heading into downtown here. And this is a typical sort of uh, urban arterial, um, uh, not particularly exciting. Uh, we've at least got some sidewalks, although you can't see they're heavily used because um, they're not. Um, well, what is this going to look like over time? This is my neighborhood uh, right around the corner from my house uh, now. Uh, what we try to do is lay out for the city, here's how some of these transitions could happen. Um, our um, sort of early thinking on this is that we need to uh, begin to design roadways in we've, which we've got AV only lanes and then we've got human driven lanes. Um, and the two don't interact. Um, there's a real sort of question about how well human drivers and, uh, and, and uh, robot vehicles or driverless, car or, uh, driverless cars will interact. Um, one of the uh, sort of the current thinking ideas is, well, let's separate them uh, and think about uh, designating uh, AV-only lanes and human-only lanes and trying to keep those two populations, if you will, apart. The good news is, if you take a close look, that AV only lane is a little smaller in width, um, which gives us a little bit extra room at the edges of this roadway. It's still sort of ugly, it's still very car oriented, but we've now made some room, potentially at least for some bike uh, uh, infrastructure along the sides there. And then as we move forward again from say 2030 to 2050, we imagine, and again this is an aggressive scenario, all AV, um, uh, a lot of the signage and the signalization has gone away. Um, 
there's now signage, if you look on the right-hand side there, there's a post sign with uh, directional um, arrows to different uh, restaurants, locations, parks, and other things like that. So the signage has gone from car-oriented to human-oriented. Again, this transitioning of our urban environment. So again, showing you that over time, our infrastructure will need to adapt, and to my mind, in some ways that are, are more uh, human-centered than they've been before. Um, redevelopment opportunities. Oh boy, your city dock is an interesting area. You've got all sorts of issues down there, parking, retail, um, access to the waterfront, uh, big festivals, uh, storm surge and flooding issues. Um, so I don't know that that's a prime site for redevelopment. That's for you to decide and not me. But there are lots of cities out there that are sitting on big surface parking lots that they may not need in about 20 years. Well, some of those urban sites can be redeveloped um, uh, and designed. Um, we can put in drop-off lanes uh, in those locations. Those redevelopment sites are, it's a lot easier to take a clean slate and do the right things than to redesign or redo existing uh, uh, urban environments. So there's some opportunities in those redevelopment sites. Uh, and I think this is a, a real benefit. Uh, I think the uh, last century was what I, I believe, and I actually don't believe it, uh, it was a suburban century. I'm actually a firm believer that uh, this century is going to be an urban one, uh, not exclusively. This is not a you must live in cities, but I think cities are hip, they're cool, they're efficient, they're economic engines, um, and I think that's, uh, that's a very, very uh, a good thing for cities, and there'll be redevelopment opportunities. So that's a, a, a sort of an obvious uh, a, a potential opportunity there. Uh, parking garages. This is some work done uh, out of a, a, a firm. I think they're uh, up in um, uh, Boston, um, although the firm, one of the design firms I know is down in Florida, in which they're looking at uh, parking garages and, and trying to think about the long-term viability of the garage. If we need fewer parking spaces because cars aren't parked there, what do we do about this? And they've got some really uh, uh, wonderful ideas about how to transition a garage from being just vehicle-oriented, human-driven vehicle-oriented, to human and AV driven um, uh, uh, vehicles, and then moving forward, this idea of reusing that space for other things down the road. And they've got some sort of fun, cool, futuristic ideas about um, uh, drone landing zones, uh, office spaces, um, uh, residential uses, uh, and, and designing the garages at the front end for uses like that in 20, 30 years, rather than uh, trying to retrofit them very expensively later on. Um, I know that's something that there's some discussion of locally, and I would sort of applaud that and say it's worth looking into. I don't know what's the right answer, but it's certainly worth, per, worth pursuing because your garages tend to last 50, 60 years, uh, and the parking needs will change. Um, and this is another example, uh, let's see, where was this one from? This is, um, I, oh, Audi uh, was working on uh, their version of a driverless uh, garage um, where you've got a pull-off zone in which people can get off, uh, get out of their vehicle, the vehicle goes and parks, but they sort of envisioned an experience um, of, uh, of uh, uh, dropping off your car and sort of giving people uh, um, sort, of a, a, sort of a unique, fun, um, uh, sort of a cool, hip experience uh, uh, in dropping off your driverless car. I'm not sure I buy the idea, but it's an interesting sort of concept to think about, that the garage in itself, um, if it's designed well, the exit area as you get out the vehicle um, as being an interesting uh, place uh, for, or an interesting experience uh, for the users. Um, this is my last slide. I've, I've gone a little longer than I intended, so I apologize about that. You, you've got the message. AVs aren't just coming, they're just about here. They're actually on the market. Um, they're expensive. Um, there aren't a lot out there. Uh, but in the next several decades, the world is going to change. Just like 100 years ago, when the automobile came along, uh, the world changed, and I don't think we were quite ready for it. I don't think we quite understood the ramifications of the automobile and its impact upon our lives, which is in many ways a good thing, but on the environment and on our built environment in ways that maybe weren't so good. Now is the time to be thinking about the impact of AVs and ride sharing on a place like Annapolis. Uh, in the last bullet there, I sort of hinted some of the things you might, as a community, start looking at. Um, you should look at things like your land use regulations and your park parking uh, um, requirements for new developments. Um, most cities over uh, require uh, in terms of their parking. Their parking standards are too high. Uh, I don't know the specifics of yours, but that's a typical story. Uh, you should be looking at your right-of-way designs, your access management strategies, where you allow vehicles 
vehicles to come into and out of traffic. Uh, start thinking about designs for those drop-off zones. These are the retrofits or the future fits that we'll need to make to accommodate this technology, to accommodate these ride-hailing um, uh, individuals, uh, and to sort of fit in this new technology and this new sort of social sharing, uh, sharing movement uh, into a place like Annapolis. So I think that's, I'm going to stop there. I think we've got some time for Q&A, and, uh, and you can throw the tomatoes now. So, Q&A. I think you're supposed to use that one. I am going to walk around and let you ask exciting questions to our speaker. Only exciting questions. You heard that. So, okay. Yeah. Um, I, I just, a couple of observations and then a question. Um, I think that uh, AVs will be here a lot sooner than you imagine. Um, I know uh, Tesla is stating that they will be available by the end of next year. That's level five. Um, I uh, am suspicious as to whether folks who own AVs are going to pay for parking. Um, they can just tell their cars drive around the block a couple of times, mm -hmm. um, which would lead to incredible congestion if everybody's owning their own AV and it's driving around. And they never let it park, absolutely. Right. Mm -hmm. So I, and I also see um, the, um, the killing field that's going on on highways with people who are drunk driving, text driving, and I can't see how much longer insurance companies are going to allow that to continue. And I think they're going to push hard to um, AVs. So I'm wondering uh, how likely or unlikely would it be for a city like Annapolis to, to simply ban privately owned vehicles from downtown and provide its own fleet of AVs to transport people. Well, that's a fascinating, I don't think I've ever been, boy, you said exciting questions and we got one off the bat here. Um, uh, let's see, I've not heard anyone looking at that, the, the cost involved, the liability involved of the fleet. Um, um, there's, there's, I can imagine all sorts of challenges. It's an interesting idea. Now, I have heard people talk about do cities have the ability to ban um, those shadow trips where uh, somebody has their personal AV, they don't want to pay for parking, and they essentially just say, circle the beltway till I call you, right, or circle downtown or whatever it is. Um, and we are, we're in, in terms of regulatory ground and insurance ground, we're in a lot of unknown uh, zones right now, a lot of unknowns there. Um, how do we track that? How do you know that the vehicle is privately owned versus one that's going to the next trip? This is a big challenge. Um, I, I've, uh, throughout this presentation, I said, if we do things well, good things will happen. This is one of the big challenges, is those shadow trips. Um, and it might not be even that you tell it to, 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 uh, uh, to circle. You might say, drop me off at work, and by the way, go home 45 minutes from now, and then pick me up at 5.30 today. Um, and then it's got that shadow trip. You know, It's, take, it's doing the commute um, even more than it would otherwise. Um, and how we regulate regulate that or do we regulate that, that is a big challenge. Long way of saying I don't have an answer for you. Yep. Just one more addition there. It wouldn't be paid for by the city, it would be part of a public private partnership. Mm -hmm. Where the company like Tesla would provide the vehicles and share the revenue. Again, an interesting idea, an interesting model. Um, how they, so the, uh, just trying to imagine sort of the, the, uh, the implementation of that. Would the vehicle be locked so it gets to a certain, you know, a certain cordon and it doesn't go outside of that? I, I, it's an interesting idea. I've not seen or heard anyone talk about that. That's an interesting idea. Real quick, the other thing you mentioned is you, you think they're coming a lot faster. I tend to be an optimist about this as well, although Tesla has made all sorts of promises as a company for many years now and not quite delivered on some of those. Um, the the, the, the uh, governor's data I put up before, I think that's low. I really do. I think that uh, um, uh, I was asked earlier today, you know, if I was to put a number on when I think the fleet will be mostly, you know, 95 percent autonomous, um, uh, I think it's the 2050, 2060 range. Um, um, uh, you think it's too late. I think that's, uh, you know, that's my best guess right now. So. Another question right here. Um, I actually have two questions. You showed a slide that had about um, nine different levels of growth in the, uh, in the AV system. Mm -hmm. Can you kind of walk us through that again real quick? Because it, I, I'm interested in the developmental aspects of it. What will happen when? And the other, the other question I have is, 
Um, it sounds like this is being all developed from a private uh, local government standpoint. Is anything happening on the national level? I'll answer the second part first. The federal government has been surprisingly reticent to get a heavily involved in, in the AV world. Uh, they, they're encouraging it. They are supporting and funding research uh, in the area with partnerships. Uh, but in terms of regulation, in terms of leadership on issues like insurance, on um, um, uh, direction as to how to retrofit communities to accommodate uh, the vehicles, they've been very, very, very quiet, and surprisingly so. Um, part of that is because they're not quite sure how fast it's going to happen. Um, and, uh, and there's also the question of which technologies are going to win out. You know, the basics of AVs are the same, but uh, um, uh, so that's, that's part of it. In terms of the levels of, um, of uh, uh, of autonomous uh, vehicles. Essentially, that went from, you know, right now there are some cars, older cars out there that have no autonomous driving features at all. No level of, um, uh, of that where there's no driver's assist, uh, there's no cruise control. It's a very crude early um, version of the car taking off some of the load of the driver. Um, increasingly now, though, you're seeing vehicles with lane assist. Increasingly now, you're seeing vehicles that if you're on, uh, you're in a, uh, in a lane and you want to move over, the vehicle will not let you move over if it senses that there's something, yes, mm -hmm. so you have a car like that. That's part of that stepping up the level. So it goes from zero uh, up to five, uh, and again, at the very top is the vehicle is truly fully autonomous, and in fact, uh, the human has no ability to drive the vehicle. That's the long run, um, no steering wheel, no pedals, the car just runs on its own and you sit there as a passenger and have no ability uh, to, to lay that out. So that's what that chart showed. A question for you. Something I saw recently <clears throat> from a colleague of mine in, uh, in Paris, France. So as we transition to AVs over the next 30, 40 years, um, and you mentioned ride sharing, Uber, Lyft. Um, you mentioned our personal vehicles sitting parked for what, 95% of mm -hmm. the time not being used. But a hybrid model like VRBO and Airbnb where private individuals allow their cars to be used when you're not, you're at work. Mm -hmm. And so you, through an app or whatever, have it uh, accessible and a person rents it like Airbnb or VRBO. Is there something out there already or, and that would alleviate uh, the need for parking, congestion, sure, additional sure. cars? That, that's another model out there. Um, it's an interesting one in which, you know, just as people that have Airbnbs, they, they rent them out to, to users and they may live there part of the time uh, or make use in vacation locations, you know, use it there two months and then the other months they use it. Uh, there is um, uh, some thinking that there'll be uh, um, that's part of the solution as well, and there'll be some early adopters that I think uh, see opportunity in that. Um, I can tell you, uh, you know, the way the big automakers look at the future and the way the big tech looks at the future is that they see that they'll be largely providing the fleet. Um, um, that's, that's what they see. Now, as to whether or not uh, uh, the, the buying public sees it that way, and that's how the market turns out, um, again, that's part of that intermediate solution. I could imagine that being part of the bridge as we get from here to that full automobile or, or autonomous uh, mobility uh, down the road. Hi, uh, my name's Bob. I've got a, a question. About 95 years ago, my grandfather lost his job driving a streetcar in L.A. Mm -hmm. And uh, mass transportation was very much in vogue then, um, but uh, special interest on the Hill, uh, led by Rockefeller and GM, created a highway system across the country and led the way to fossil fuel engines taking over mm -hmm. the economy. The special interests are still in place today. Um, I think it's partly the answer to the why federal government is not involved. Mm -hmm. I have a very strong skeptical um, sense that the demographics are going to what drives the politics which will drive the change. And it's the, the romance that our generation and my father's generation has with the automobile. Mm -hmm. the, the flair and the individual sexiness of having your own freedom that was open-ended, you know, 80, 100 years ago. Mm -hmm. How do we get the federated model down to the national, state, and local? How do we get special interest out of this? I could almost name you the special interest I know that will be fighting this mm -hmm. API and a few others sure, sure. that are petroleum interested. How do you address the political aspects of this for 
not my generation, but my kids and my grandkids. Right. Well, this is, that, that's such a great question, and if the, I, don't believe, I think the mayor may have stepped out. I turned to the mayor at this point and asked uh, uh, him. Um, I'd say that tongue-in-cheek. Um, the politics of it um, and the impacts of you, you started off by saying there are, uh, and, and uh, Robert and I talked about this earlier, this idea of winners and losers when it comes to AVs. Um, there are lots of people that are employed in the transportation industry right now that their industry is at minimum at risk, and, and, and in, in many cases, it's the dinosaur um, and, and, the, uh, and the comet's coming, right? It's coming down and, and the world is going to change for them. Taxi drivers, uh, truckers, uh, there are lots of uh, delivery people that I think in the long run uh, the technology will come along. Um, and there are real impacts upon lives and livelihoods and, and real concern about that. Um, I don't have a good answer as to, you know, the, I can tell you, the, uh, uh, and just as you see, the hotel industry and Airbnb, they fight like cats and dogs about what's allowed there. Uh, the parking industry is, is very substantial and very entrenched. Uh, and it's in their interest to make sure people still want to park uh, and pay for the right to do so. Um, as to how we navigate all that, um, uh, boy, do you have another few hours to, to, to have a town hall and talk about navigating national politics? I, I don't mean to be tongue-in-cheek. I don't know. I, you know that, is, that is a big issue. Part of the reason I think Mr. Clark asked me to come is to talk about this topic is it's not clearly, not specifically about your city dot challenge, right? There's lots in that regarding parking and climate change and, and flooding and redevelopment and, and, and retail and all the things going on there, um, I'm here to be a bit provocative and say, by the way, there's some technology and social changes that are happening. Yes, sir. What was different about the demographics in Seattle that made, that made their change a little more feasible? Well, I can tell you, that is a very tech-heavy community. So I, I lived in Seattle five years. I was actually out there just a few weeks ago and touring around and getting a sense of what they were up to. Um, part of it is um, they have tech leadership out there and big industry out there. You know, the, the, the tech industry wants this stuff to succeed. Why? Because a lot of the stuff is technology, right? And there are users and there's revenues and it's in their interest too. So they're very interested and they're very uh, heavily influential in the local government there. So um, I can tell you that the city of Seattle um, um, does some really interesting things on the information front. And one of, the, one of the sort of comments that I've made throughout the day as I've met with people about City Doc is there's a lot of talk about parking in the parking garage, and I keep saying, what's your data? I'm a social scientist. What does the data show you? Do you actually have a parking shortage? Do you know that, and when is it, and where is it, and what are the challenges? Is it a perception of parking issue, or is it actually a parking issue? Um, uh, do you have any data on, on ride-sharing services? Uh, do you have any data on other trips and how heavily used your bike share program is? These are the type of data that I think lead to better decisions down the road, um, and Seattle is a leader in, as I say, information drives the, the investment there, and that's a real benefit. The politics piece, I, I wish I had an answer, but I don't. Uh, question on cost. We have this very tight, small street city. Mm -hmm. Bus transport doesn't always get people to where they want to go. So has there been any work done on where the long-term costs are going? Because we've got a lot of people in the city who don't have a car, mm -hmm. who count on the bus transportation, but it doesn't always take them to where jobs are or where they need to be hospitals or uh, shopping. Is there a cost projection that would say this is going to drive the cost down for individuals? The, I can tell you the, the early evidence, and again, we're early days on some of this stuff. The early evidence is that over the long run, um, the, with, but with the ride sharing and the AV coming along, that it will bring those trip costs down. Um, I can tell you there's a lot of angst in the, uh, in, the, um, uh, in the mass transit community about this. What does this mean for buses? What does this mean for rail and other things? Uh, my own view on this, um, and again, I'm not a transportation planner, but my own view on this is that those trunk systems, those mainline systems, will continue to be successful. The more uh, spread out, Tallahassee is a very suburban city. Our bus system goes everywhere inefficiently, I would say with a smile. I'm glad my mayor isn't here. He would not be happy to be saying that, but it's true. It's, it's not a very efficient system. The headways are, are, every, are about every hour. You know, people don't use it very much. Um, that's a system that 
AVs um, and more generally sort of ride sharing as the cost comes down um, um, and as Tallahassee becomes a market that, that uh, ride sharing is really a viable option um, is actually a better option. So it depends on the community. Um, in your big urban settings, those trunk lines, as I say, your subways, your, your, your bus rapid transit, your long haul lines, they should still be fine. Um, but our sometimes inefficient bus systems, um, the, the early sort of thinking on this is that uh, the rise of AVs and the rise of ride sharing, the rise of ride sharing already is actually to the benefit of those communities that, uh, and those individuals and communities that may not have a private automobile. Um, that doesn't, it's not as good as having an automobile if you can afford to have it, but it's better than uh, transit in many cases. Uh, hello, Dr. Chapman. Thank you very much for coming today. I really enjoyed this. Uh, kind of echo a couple of the thoughts uh, that, that were stated already regarding uh, the cost. I truly believe the economics mm -hmm. are what's going to cause this to become so much cheaper. Ride sharing will be cheaper. Uh, public transit will be cheaper when you take out that human driver that mm -hmm. you have to pay, right? But I really want to turn to the uh, gentleman that was to my left mm -hmm. and, and kind of continuing with a question that he kind of uh, brought up was around the insurance. And I think that is going to be the number one driver that actually pushes people a lot faster to the AVs, as, and I agree with him that I think the timeline is very conservative up here. Uh, but so I, I looked a lot um, at a couple studies that came out about this uh, from actuarial science uh, to demonstrate what they think um, the insurance cost would be for a human driver versus an AV. Mm -hmm. Uh, and and they, they seem very drastically different, and I could see that being a push. Could you expound a little bit more on what that might be, or do you have any data around it? You know, I, I will, let's see, the short answer is I don't know a lot about the insurance side of things. It's not something I've looked at. I'm an urban planner by training, um, so I, I do not. What little I do know is that um, with the expectation that AVs will cause a lot fewer accidents um, and, uh, and, and the uh, and, the, and the thinking that there will be big institutional uh, providers of the, uh, the shared AVs, right? If you've got the Nissan and the BMW, and they get really, um, uh, and there are fewer accidents, there are fewer fatalities, um, and a lot of the costs that come along with that, there's an expectation that there will be real substantial um, uh, insurance um, uh, savings down the road as to how those are passed on or if they're passed on. Um, uh, I just don't know. This is not an area I'm, I'm, you know, I, I have... The folks I've talked to in the state of Florida, and Florida's trying to be a national leader in some of our policy, um, they say that uh, their, their pitch is the insurance industry is going to figure this out. They've been figuring out insurance for the better part of several centuries via all sorts of uh, um, travel modes, um, uh, uh, shipping cargo, and all sorts of things. They'll figure this one out too. Uh, but the short answer, I really don't have a good answer to that because I don't know enough about that, that world to speak in a knowing way. We have, I think, two more questions okay. for you, Jim Martin and Shelley Rowe. Okay. I'm glad Shelley's following me. She'll actually have more professional comments. Um, about 35 years ago, maybe a little longer than that, I took a trip around the country with a friend using only public transportation. Uh, it was very eye-opening. Seattle had a 100-block downtown area that they designated as free step-on, step-off buses, public buses. Mm -hmm. And the reason they did that is because they had a lot of traffic congestion. When we were there, we observed that there was minimal amount of traffic congestion. There was busy, it was busy, but it was not congested. Mm -hmm. um, so I think they're ahead of the game just because they're 30 years ahead of everybody else. The, when, when I was involved in planning West Street's development in the inner West Street area, we put in garage infrastructure all along the street, knowing that if we're going to build buildings, we had to have places for people to park their cars. Um, I think that the trend you're talking about toward AVs is going to happen faster than you think, mm -hmm. or than people may project. Um, but I am encouraged and we have struggled with transportation in the city of Annapolis for a long time because we're unwilling to put the money and investment in it to make it work better. Um, and there are reasons for that. AVs could be successful almost immediately if we convince the hotels and the restaurants in the downtown to go out and pick up their clients and bring them in town, or in the case of the hotels, shuttle their people around within the city. Mm -hmm. um, 
And that could be a private project that's worked out with people like Town Park. It's a parking company. So that's all I need to say. Great. And as I come over to give the mic to Shelley, do we have any other comments? OK, we have one more after Shelley. And I'm just getting the, uh, the sign that it'll definitely be Shelley and one more, and then we will, we will give charge. everybody yeah. a break. Dr. Chapin, first of all, thank you so much. Um, I'm the former director of the U.S. Department of Transportation's Intelligent Transportation Office. Oh, wonderful. So you can speak much more knowingly than I about well, this. Well, yeah, it was a while back. Okay. Um, and so that office is the one that funded the U.S. Department of Transportation's Connected Vehicle Research Program at that time. And we partnered with NHTSA on the early days of the AV funding. Mm -hmm. And so I have two things to say. Please. One is, this was excellent. And I agree with everything that you've said today. And I also agree with the timing that you guessed. I mean, we don't know, but I think that that timing that you, sur you surmise, I think that's about on the mark from everything that I see in here. Because we have to appreciate, while there are massive cost drivers and massive industry reasons for why this is going to move forward, it's really complicated technology. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of risk, as we've seen in some of the really high profile crashes. So it's, it's going to take a bit, and as you alluded to, the tricky part is in the next few decades when we've got AVs increasing, but regular vehicles still in the mix. Yes. When I do programs like what you're doing here, that's the question. So what do we do today? Because clearly we have to do something today. And I talk about flexibility, mm -hmm. flexibility in design, whether it's a parking garage or street systems. And I'm just wondering if you could just sum up for us, what do you think that we do today as we look at investments that have to be made? We can't wait 30 years. And how do we plan for flexibility in light of all that you've said? Great, great. So first of all, uh, I'll p get your check later for the nice comments about the talk. So thank you <laughs> for that. Um, so, uh, so, uh, uh, second of all, um, sort of getting to this issue of one of the challenges that communities face uh, when, they, when they're engaging with tough issues like this is everyone wants the answer, and they think there is an answer. Um, and in social sciences, we talk about these things called wicked problems. And autonomous vehicles as a technology, but cities as sort of a place, are very wicked in terms of the, the ramifications of if you do X, that causes all of these other unintended consequences. Um, planning as a discipline for a long time has talked about, well, if we just do the, if we make the right decisions today, we'll have a Shangri-La, a city on a hill, a perfect, a perfect community later on, and that's not the way it is. So this idea of planning amidst uncertainty. Um, my view is, is, is now, that's, now is the time for communities, and it's sort of my, one of my takeaway points when I go around and talk about this topic is the one thing to do is to be to, to learn more about this right to go to talks like this and this is my take on this there are lots of other people that have they're great I should have put up and I'm happy to send actually Robert I'll send you a list of of readings and books on this topic that you can share with who's ever interested um, we don't know the future but we know it's changing so um, being you know monitoring looking for places that are thought leaders and doing good work again I've held up Seattle uh, they're one good example the city of New York is doing some neat things big cities uh, I had a question earlier from somebody at, at one of the meetings about well, what about small cities uh, who are the leaders and the answer is I really don't know I don't don't know of any mid-sized cities that are uh, uh, that have taken a great uh, leadership on this. So there's an opportunity there. So monitor what's going on. Um, think deeply about. It's not just about. Um, well, we need to have a garage. It's not, the garage isn't the solution to all the problems, right? A, a new garage helps in some ways and hurts in others, and it's only partially related to what I'm talking about here today. But thinking about your parking requirements, right? When somebody builds something new, how many spaces do they have to build? Uh, there are codes uh, typically wrapped up in that, and they're usually too many, um, usually, not always. Um, thinking about uh, those, uh, the, the, the uh, drop-off zones uh, and where you want to accommodate them, uh, getting good data on ridership and how people are actually using the transportation system. Uh, these are investments in good decision-making. Uh, uh, we were, live in this era of austere government in which everyone says, keep down the cost of local governments, but if you use 
money wisely now to invest in good data that helps you make good decisions that will actually save you money later on. What should you be doing now? Um, uh, uh, again, getting to know some of these trends that are happening, having better data locally, um, thinking about uh, over the long run, um, uh, if you do move to sort of a shared, uh, uh, a, a, um, what I, I tell some communities, they say, we sort of like this idea of a parking reserve or sort of a holding lot, uh, almost like the cell phone zones at, uh, at airports where people can sort of leave their car. Well, well, now's the time to begin thinking about where might you want that to be and how will the cars get in and out of your busy areas along those lines. Um, I'm speaking very sort of vaguely about this because we just don't quite know, but remaining, uh, 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 remaining uh, engaged, um, looking around and scanning the environment for other ideas um, is, is one of the best things you can do. Um, and, uh, and then advocate uh, to your elected officials uh, that they should be paying attention to this as well. Um, uh, make sure that you're passing this along to your neighbors and say, you know, do you know much about this? Uh, um, but you know, being good citizens is being engaged, and, and, and they can be part of the solution as well. So long, meandering answer. I wish I could tell you do these three things, but we don't know what to do yet. Our last question. Okay. In your role as a policy thought leader and in your academic and your consulting practice, is anybody challenging you on the data sharing envi environment and, and privacy? Oh, of course. Yeah, that's a real concern. Um, uh, and uh, right now... Um, you know, who, who has access to those data. Um, there's a real, well, that's a, that's a whole other topic for a whole other day, right? Is if we have, um, what's, what's fascinating is we have tremendous data on travel behavior. Um, of there, it's out there in the world. Most of it's in private hands, and most of the time it's not shared. Um, one of the things that the city of Seattle is actively doing is trying to work with some of their uh, corporate partners to get access to some of that data, um, have it largely stripped of, of, of sort of uh, as much identifying information as they can, but to understand low, as much as they can, because uh, people are going from destination to destination. Um, but that helps them understand the load on their systems and think about the investments required. But yes, this is a big, um, you know, in, in a perfect world, we'd have access to these data because it would help our infrastructure be more sound, be more useful, be more efficient, make wiser investments. But at the end of the day, most of us don't want other people knowing our travel behavior. Uh, and that's, that's understandable. So that's get pushback on that all the time. Yes, sir. Dr. Chapin, thank you so much. You've given us a lot to think about tonight. Thank you.